Amen. Well, it's great to be back in Tucson. I always love coming down here. I know it's a long drive, and it's also colder today. It's a little colder here than in Phoenix, but anyway, it's a blessing to be here. Uh, keep praying for uh, Brother Russell's family, his wife. As far as I know, she has not gone in labor yet, but um, maybe it, maybe she is right now. We don't know, but always be praying uh, for them. Uh, the title of my sermon today is Parents, uh, you know, Raise Boys Like Boys and Girls Like Girls. R boys and girls are different for a reason, and we're going to, uh, for a godly reason, and we're going to look at that today. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, I want to focus on uh, verse 9 there. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor re re revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. And the key thing I want to focus on here is the sin of being effeminate. And there's been quite a few stories that I've seen, or quite a few uh, uh, life examples that this sermon needs to be preached today more than ever. Recently, my family, I took my son to the park, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, if anything, it was a ninja park. It's in Gilbert. It's pretty cool if you ever get a chance to go there, but it's a cool park that's kind of like American Ninja Warrior where they have monkey bars and all these feats of strength. And there was two kids there, and I, I was like, oh, you know, you guys are nice. And, or they were talking to us or whatever and, you know, laughing at my son. They're probably nine years old. But I, I said, are you guys brothers? And he said, no, that's my sister. And I was like, sister, what in the world? And almost to like their shame, which I didn't mean to pick on a little kid. It's not their fault that their parents, you know, dressed them exactly the same. But sure enough, my wife told me, you know, that actually was a girl. I'm like, you know, girl, good, good grief. And so, you know, in today, in 2020 America, there's this agenda that blurs these lines between boys and girls, trying to make them the same. This same situation happened the other day. I took my son to the park, and there's this, this thing there, this it there. And I don't know what it was. And, you know, my son picked up some uh, wood chips and started throwing it at it. And I was just like, normally I would stop this situation. But, hey, <laughs> you, know, he's, you know, what are you going to do? Is it a boy or a girl? I don't know. You know, what is this? And, you know, you want, I don't know what you should do in that situation because it's just a child. Do you say, like, excuse me, are you a boy or a girl? Do you ask the parents, like, is this bothering you? And anyway, it, it's just another one of those straws that broke the camel's back, which is why this sermon needs to be preached. There's another situation that, you know, we just had Thanksgiving. I met with my dad. My dad is climbing up ASU Mountain. There's a mountain. It's a small mountain. It's about a 10-minute hike in, in Tempe. And my dad sees this, this child, and he compliments the, the, the adult, saying, wow, you're daughter is climbing this mountain so well you know how old is she four or five and he's like well thanks but that's actually my son the son had like the fabio hair you know down the back and it's just like what world are we living in and people have criticized me for moving to an area we recently just bought purchased a house and our, our house isn't the nicest of neighborhoods it's not what you would think would be like the perfect you know white picket fence nice neighborhood but I'll tell you, you know, the kids at, at my local park, except, except for the thing that was there that one time, even though they're a little rough around the edges, I would rather have rough around the edges, you know, teenagers smoking at the park than have to explain to my son what the thing is, you know, the, the boys and girls looking the exact same, this brother, sister, at the, at the nicer park down the street. And so this sermon needs to be preached, and it's a sin to be effeminate. I've got another story. I, I sold this bed on offer up and this kid is helping his mom and the mom says and, and the son's name was jake the same name as me and so she said jake can you help me lift this in the in the in the truck bed and i'm thinking you know are you talking to me you're talking to your son and it turns out we have the same name but she turns out she was talking to me because apparently her son can't do it her son was probably 16 years old maybe 17 and i was like well you'd be surprised it's not that heavy and he's like, well, I'm a man of science. I can't lift the thing. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with you? Man of science, what does it have anything to do with anything? So what, you're a man of science? Lift, lift it. It's a, it's a bed frame. Well, I'm a man of science. 
well, you're not a man at all. <laughs> you know, he pip squeaks. So, you know, we need to teach our, our, our boys to be boys and our girls to be girls. And there's a difference here. And, you know, my mom, you know, we recently had Thanksgiving. My mom works as a school teacher in Colorado. And she recently told me that uh, there's this big problem in, in the school system where, and, and the school systems are basically run by women. Women, you know, in public school, they're the teachers. Sometimes there's a woman principal, maybe of a male principal. But these uh, teachers are basically giving prescriptions or, or asking their parents to get Ritalin prescriptions for their third grade boys. Why? Because they're too rambunctious in the classroom. They're not sitting still and coloring like the nice girls are. You know, they like to color and, you know, sit quietly and sit still. The boys are wrestling or trying to roughhouse or trying to, you know, play some sort of war game. When I was a third grader, I got in trouble because I, I took a, one of those erasers and put it on the the back of my pencil and I chased a kid around like a like a hammer or something saying oh, I'm gonna get you and they said no you know you're in trouble listen we need to teach boys to be boys girls to be girls young men to act like young men and young ladies to act like young ladies husbands to act like husbands and wives to act like wives that's what the Bible says that's what God wants and so you know parents need to know that God created boys and girls differently for a perfect and holy reason we're going to look at this today, and we're going to make sure that, you know, people, you know, judgment starts in the house of God. We need to make sure that we're going to start here and raise our young men to be men and our young women to be women. So go ahead and jump with me to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29. I want to show you my first point today is that men should be strong. Genesis chapter 29. I love this story. This is the story of Jacob uh, basically going out and seeking his wife, uh, uh, trying to find a wife which is something that every young man should do, uh, you know, for 99% of us. Every young man should go out and, and find his wife. And uh, it's a little different in today. Today they tell, you know, Sadie's Ho Sadie Hawkins dance. You know, they tell the wives to go out and find their own husbands. And, and that happens where women go and, and, and introduce themselves to the, to the boys. But that's not necessarily ideal. Let's look at Genesis chapter 29, uh, starting in verse 1. Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field. And, lo, there was three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of, out of that well they watered the flocks. And, the great, and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither were all the flocks gathered. And they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep. And put the stone again upon the well's mouth in its in his place. And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. And they said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together, till they roll the stone from the well's mouth, and we water the sheep. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came from the father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass, this is the key, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near, and rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Let's stop there. So what we see in this story, I, I really like this story. And I want to clarify that the kiss that he gave to Rachel, that was nothing romantic. That would be the kiss that you would give your European uncle or something. And different cultures have different sort of ways. You know, thank God we're American. So the point here, you know, it's just very strange. What we see here is that there's this really heavy stone, and, and I don't know if it's a, you know, a round stone or if it's some kind of flat stone or something. It looks like it does roll, so it must, be, it must have rounded edges. Maybe it's just like an actual you know, sphere of a stone. And it's really, really heavy, and so what's being implied here is that they can't lift the stone. It's like a lid. When they lift it, the water comes up from underneath. And what's being implied is that it takes more than one person to lift this stone or to roll this stone away. They need at least three people. There's three different flocks of sheep. It's like a community gathering. Wait till everybody arrives. You know, circle the wagons, and then together we'll lift the stone. And, you know, sometimes, you know, if you ever lift something heavy, sometimes you need an extra set of hands. 
I recently purchased a refrigerator a long time ago, and I tried to lift that fridge into my truck by myself, and you just need an extra set of hands, just because sometimes it's too heavy. But this goes to show you the kind of strength that we see Jacob had. Now, Jacob here is representing God's people. You know, this is kind of his ancestors or his, uh, you know, mother's uh, family, extended family, but God's blessing is on Jacob. So we can learn a lot from his character in this situation. But Jacob, he sees the beautiful girl. He sees his future wife. And all of a sudden, he's motivated. He says, I'll go lift the stone. And he, you know, lifts the stone all by himself. And that's what we see, you know, strong men of God, strong people who are, are, are Christian, people who trust the Lord, they should have some strength to them. It's a, you know, I'm talking about physical strength, being able to lift something heavy. And of course, you know, it's hard to just go out and be strong all of a sudden, but this should be your goal to have strength. And honestly, this is what inspired me to preach this sermon was when the Jake the weakling with my same name, oh, I'm a man of science, I can't lift that. It was like 40 pounds. You know, you should be able to lift that, that amount of weight and help your mom. His mom lifted it. You know, it's not right. And so we need to make sure that we have some strength. Now, Jacob, you know, he probably thought he could lift the heavy stone. He probably knew he could lift the heavy stone or at least try because he had already been lifting other heavy things. And that's basically how the world works. You don't just go someday and say, well, here's a grand piano. I'm going to go lift this piano. You don't just go to the, to the, to the heaviest thing in the room. Typically, you start slowly, you start small, and you kind of build up that strength. And that's what I want to encourage the young men to do here is, you know, over the course of your time uh, uh, growing up and, and, you know, getting older and getting more mature, focus on gathering your physical strength. You know, the world today wants men to be weak, and they want men to think that they're weak. I told this boy, I told Jake, I said, hey, you're probably stronger than you think. You could probably lift it if you tried. And his mom said, oh, you're too polite. You know, that's not a good situation. And what's, what's sad about this is because this family, I, I don't know much about them. It was just an offer-up deal, but they had, you know, that stereotypical Trump, Pence bumper sticker on the side. They'd probably go to a, you know, fun center, non-denominational church, and they're probably teaching kids, you know, to, you know, worship God is just to, you know, rock out, man, and Jesus culture, man, and, you know, just kind of chill, man. You're, come as you are. You know, at this church, we want to get stronger. We want to learn better. We want to become, you know, more mature and, and reach that pinnacle peak or, or that mountain. We want to be able to do things. And part of that becomes having strength. You know, it's a very simple idea, but when a man marries a woman, there used to be this tradition where the man would pick up his wife and bring her into the house that he would have either built for her or, you know, bought for her or something through his work. And if you're going to do that, you're going to have some strength. You should be able to pick up your wife and take her from the car into the house. And, I mean, what's this guy going to do? Is he going to get a wheelchair? Ask his mom. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? You need some strength. You need to have some physical strength. And I know it's tough, you know, with the COVID stuff and, and the viruses closing a lot of gyms. My office where I usually go into work, they have a free gym for me, and I would go there and you know, lift some weights. But, you know, I, nobody's going into the office these days or, you know, m most gyms are closed or maybe your gym will close again with the next lockdown. But I have found what I think is probably the most cheapest uh, way to work out. And, uh, you know, I, it's not for everybody, but tractor tire flipping. Has anybody seen these heavy tires? It's, a, it's, a, it's something I've known about for a long time. I did it in high school, but it's coming back. For about $40, you can go and buy these big tractor tires. You're going to need a truck. But you go there and you basically, you know, take the tire and you lift the tire and you push the tire over and you do it again and again and again. And next thing you know, you're going to be a lot stronger. And this is a great exercise, number one, because it's roughly cheap. It's cheap to get. It doesn't take a workout set and all these complex muscle movements. But number two, I'm recommending the tractor tire because it's a compound muscle movement. You're doing your legs, you're doing your calves, you're doing your biceps as you lift the tire. You're doing your, your pectoral muscles as you push the tire over. And then, of course, it's cardio because you're doing it again and again and again. Now, there's other ways to do it. I'm not here to tell you how to work out or whatever. But you should, you know, find something heavy, young men, and try to lift it. You know, and be safe. Don't get yourself hurt. Don't rip anything. But try to have some strength and build some strength. You know, this, another way to do this is when you buy groceries, you go out and help your mom carry the groceries in and just see how many bags you can put on one hand. 
you know, can you carry all the groceries on one, on two hands and one trip? There's little things you can do to try to build up that strength. And I think it's important. So, and, and I want to clarify because you don't have to be a bodybuilder. And, you know, I'm saying this, my brother is an amateur bodybuilder and he's super strong. You don't have to be super strong. But you should be able to do common things. You should be able to pick up your wife, you know, and move her across the thing. You should be able to, you know, move like a, a refrigerator. You got to work that refrigerator into the house. You know, sometimes, you know, assembling a bed frame. There's some parts of being a man that you have to have some physical strength. And when I was in high school, anytime you'd have to arm wrestle somebody, sometimes we'd res- wrestle the parents or the, the teachers, we, we'd always complain as, as students that we would lose because we didn't have that man strength. What is man strength? Man strength is when you say, I'm going to win no matter what. I'm, you know, I'm not going to let some teenage high school punk beat me. And you, you get mad and you win the, the, the contest. That's man strength. When you have to pick up the fridge in the back of your truck and you've got to convince the other weakling guy to lift the fridge with you, you say, hey, buddy, you're going to lift this fridge right now. We're going to do it right now. And you get angry and you, you kind of like get that adrenaline boost and lift the fridge. Women do this too. When they're, you know, I've heard stories of women getting their children stuck behind cars and all of a sudden they supernaturally lift the car. I mean, I pray that never happens. But I've heard of stories like that happening. It could be a, a, a myth, I guess. But the point is, is that when you're mad enough, when you have to do it, when no one else is there to help you, you got to tap into that man strength and get it done and lift the thing. And that's what this Jake, oh, I'm a man of science. (laughs) What an excuse, huh? Yeah, what an excuse. So go ahead and turn to Genesis, well, turn to Genesis chapter 32. Let me read for you Proverbs chapter 20. The glory of young men is their strength. And the beauty of old men is the gray head. The glory of young men is their strength. You know, young men are not necessarily known for being the most wise. In fact, usually you have to, you know, rein that young man back in from jumping off the cliff a little too high. Or, you know, we went to the Grand Canyon and Pastor Anderson was like, Jake, you stay away from the edge. You know, this was five years ago or six years ago. You know, young men aren't necessarily known for their wisdom or their experience, even though it's growing. Older men are known for the beauty of an old man is the gray head. But the glory of a young man is their strength. And so if you're young today, you know, time is on your side. Your body's on your side. Your hormones are on your side. Build some strength. So you turn to Genesis chapter 32. I want to show you that Jacob must have been pretty strong because because he gets an amazing opportunity to wrestle with God. He wrestles with pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Uh, Genesis chapter 32, verse 24, the Bible reads, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. And he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob, and he said, thy name shall be no more called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, thou hast power with God and with man, men, and hast prevailed. He's winning the wrestling match. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now, if anybody's visiting for the first time, and we'll stop there. If anybody's visiting, you may be asking yourself, you know, how can, God, how can someone see God's face? Because there's clear commandments that says no one can see God's face and live. But that's talking about God the Father. You know, we believe in the Trinity here, amen. We have God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the Son, people see the Son. People, people all over the world, I mean, would have come in to, to Israel and seen uh, uh, Jesus Christ's face. And we see here that this is just one uh, appearance of Jesus Christ pre-incarnate. And that's why he keeps his name a secret. You know, that's why uh, Jacob is saying that he's seen God face to face and my life is preserved. In other places, Jesus would say, take off your your shoes for it's holy ground. And so what I want to focus on is that, you know, Jacob must have been pretty strong because he got this opportunity to wrestle Jesus Christ. Nobody else has done this, as far as I know. Nobody else has wrestled him. Why did Jesus want to wrestle him? I don't know. It's kind of a mystery to me. But there's a, there's a true fundamental fact here that we can learn from this, and it's simply that 
small victories lead to bigger opportunities. And what I mean by that is back in what I've already shown you in the earlier part in Genesis, we see Jacob lifting the heavy stone, right? He's picking a heavy stone up. Why? To get married to, and then to start his family and to basically start his career. Little victories lead to bigger opportunities. First, it starts lifting a tire. Then it starts lifting a heavy stone. Now you have a wife. Next thing you know, you're, you're wrestling the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, things kind of progress like this. So even if you're young today, you know, still take some time and try to work on your strength because that strength may take you further than you, than you know. Next thing you know, you're wrestling God. So wrestling, you know, is a very tough sport. It requires sport. It's also that competition. You know, I'm going to get you. I'm going to, I'm going to win and dominate. And I would also encourage, you know, young men here to be involved in some sort of sport that would have some sort of high pressure instincts or some, some pressure situation. What I mean by that is baseball, for example. Now, I never played baseball, to be, to be fair. But baseball, if you can imagine, you're up there to bat and everybody's watching you. You're up there to bat. You got three, stri three strikes and you're out, right? You got that pressure. Are you going to hit a home run? Or are you going to strike out? Are you going to hit a foul ball? Are you going to make it on base? You know, everybody's watching you. The pressure of what to do, and you have to perform under pressure. I think that's something that men instinctively should be better at uh, than women or than, their, than their, their wives, is performing under pressure when the time counts. You know, maybe it's a, a football game and you're the kicker or something and you've got to kick that ball through the, the goalpost. You know, you better not mess up. You better do it right. And there's something about being a man that you have to perform well under pressure. And I think that's also something to, to mention here. So, <clears throat> my son is two years old, and, and I didn't introduce my, my wife, I'm sure most of you know, but my wife Valerie is in the baby room here with my son, James, and, and our new daughter, Victoria, she was born five weeks ago. But he's two years old, and he loves to wrestle, you know, and, and rough house. And he's only two. Now, I, my daughter, she's only five weeks old, so I, she's not really into wrestling, but I don't think she would be into wrestling. But, you know, young boys are, they need to get that energy out, they like to climb things. And we should encourage that as parents, not discourage that. And lastly here, before we move on, is that, you know, wrestling and, and being strong is a, good, is a good example of self-defense. And why are men stronger than women? You know, men have a job to protect the women. And men have a job to, you know, shoot away the coyotes or, or to build the house, to labor all day long for other people. Self-defense. So I would encourage you to, you know, take a karate class or, you know, I'm, I'm saying that because I've never done it, but take some sort of wrestling class, play some sort of competitive sport, even if it's, you know, ping pong or something and you just got to win that game, take it seriously and win. I've got this, you know, crazy story. I, I, I'm thinking of so many stories all of a sudden, but there was this time when I was, I, I may have preached this last time I was here, but there was a time when I was at a, a I think I did preach this. I was at a, a dodgeball tournament. Did I preach that a long time ago? quickly a dodgeball tournament we're there we're taking it so seriously we're winning we're dominating you know it's all my my friends in this youth group the fun center church and then our feminine so i think the guy was a fag this this youth pastor right guys you're taking this too seriously it's just a game <laughs> he killed the vibe you know we were like yeah we're gonna win we're gonna dominate and we were you know we're, we're really into it and this guy just threw this wet blanket over everything. And, and I never will forget that. I thought, you are not a leader. You are not a man. And I probably just quit the church. I mean, I was only a kid then, but that was the end of it. You know, I was like, all right, that's the end of it. And so it's good to learn how to perform. It's good to learn how to win and, and dominate. And if maybe for you, you know, it's, it's taking your son out hunting and seeing that game lined up there and pulling the trigger and, you know, having, exercising your dominion over the animals. Maybe it's fishing. You know, you grab the fish and you got to beat it with a rock or something. It's important for men to learn this thing. So let's move on. Go ahead and go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 in the New Testament there. My second point here is simply that women are the weaker vessel. You shouldn't expect too much from your daughter as far as strength goes. Women are the weaker vessel. I was climbing a, a big tower, Genesis Tower, and this man, you know, the Genesis Tower is a park at, at Mesa Riverview Park in, in Mesa, Arizona. If anybody comes out there, it's a great place to come. It's a great place to go soul winning. I do a lot of soul winning there. But there's this big tower, and sometimes after you get somebody saved, it's nice to go climb the tower and get a little exercise in and come back down. 
you know, which is something I enjoy. But this tower is, is kind of freaky for people who haven't climbed it before. And I've taken some of my friends, people from our church, to go climb this tower. And some of them didn't even make it up the top just because of fear of heights. And, you know, they, it was just too much too soon. I'm sure if they took baby steps, they could do it. But there was one time I was climbing this tower and there was a man up there with his daughter. She was probably seven years old and she was terrified. You know, she's up there just shaking on this tower. It's like a rope tower type thing. It's a rope uh, stringed tower. And she's up there shaking, just terrified. And the, the dad's saying, you know, come on, sweetheart, you can do it. You can do it. And I'm sure, you know, kids go up there all the time. I'm sure she could have done it. But this parent just was expecting her daughter to be some sort of rock climber, you know, it's as if he didn't have a son to get this joy out of climbing the tower with somebody who had to have his daughter climb the tower, climb the tower. And I remember thinking, you know, she's a girl. She, she doesn't have to be some brave athlete to climb the tower. If she wants to, great. But, you know, if you, there's an old saying, if you can't do it in a skirt, maybe you shouldn't do it. And so if you're climbing this big tower, you know, and she was worldly. She didn't have a skirt on. And anyway, it was just unfair to that poor girl to be forced to be the super rock star climbing person when clearly her emotions were taking over saying i'm holding on for dear life crying and whatever it wasn't fair for that 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 poor woman or girl so let's take a look at this first peter chapter three we'll start in verse one likewise ye wives be in subjections to your own husbands that if any obey not the word they also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives while they while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it be that outward adorning of the plaiting of hair and wearing of gold. Oh, sorry, I forgot the not there. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting of the hair and wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. You know, we should raise our girls to be meek and quiet which is the opposite of some sort of, you know, triathlete warrior, ninja warrior climbing the tower, which in the sight of God is of great price. After this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, basically means sir, whose daughter ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, we'll stop there. This is a great warning. He's saying, you know, husband, if you don't honor your wife, your prayers are going to be hindered. Have you ever prayed, you know, dear God, help me with this, help me with this, and you feel like your prayers aren't going past the ceiling? Well, maybe you've dishonored your wife in some way, some way that you know, maybe she's not even aware of, but some way that God's aware of. You know, that's a big deal. You don't want to get your prayers hindered by dishonoring your wife. You need to give honor to her. She's the weaker vessel. And yes, the Bible calls the wife, it calls women compared to men, the weaker vessel. Now, I don't have this in my notes, but, you know, women are the weaker vessel when it comes to a husband-wife relationship. And, and, and certainly that's true. But what I'll show you later when we get into Proverbs, I'll show you that, uh, well, it's not in my notes, the women back in Egypt, if you remember, the, the Pharaoh declared that the women should, the midwives should take the young boys and throw them into the river. And I'm hoping I'm not going too fast with this part of the sermon. But yeah, so Pharaoh declared that the, the women made child should be kept alive and that the men child should be thrown into the river. And that's why we see Moses was hidden and he went down. Well, what we see is that the, the midwives feared God and they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to throw the babies into the river, so they didn't do it. But the excuse that they gave to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's like, why are you not doing this? The excuse that Pharaoh, that the midwives gave to Pharaoh was simply that the Hebrew women were too lively, they were too strong, and that they gave birth before the midwives had even gotten there, which is a good thing. You want your birth to go well. It's usually a bad thing if the birth process takes too long. Usually that means you end up in the hospital. And so the, the excuse, I don't know if it's true or not, because technically, you know, they weren't going to throw the, the babies in the river anyway. They feared God. And God blessed them with houses. But what we see here is that the Egyptian people bought this, which means that there was obviously a separation, a difference between the Hebrew women were stronger than the worldly Egyptian women. And so I just want to put this in perspective here is that when I say that, you know, in a husband, 
wife relationship, the wife is the weaker vessel, which is what the Bible says. I still think that God's people, the Proverbs 31 woman, for example, is in general a stronger woman than, you know, some Paris Hilton type walking around with her little dog in the, in the, in the purse or whatever. God's, God's women are still going to be stronger than the women of the world, even though they are the weaker vessel in that relationship. Does that make sense? So what we see here is that women are the weaker vessel. If you have a daughter, you know, she's not going to be as strong as her older brother. I have a daughter. She's not going to be as strong as her older brother. There's a different uh, set of expectations there. You shouldn't raise them to be the same. They're different. They're going to like different things. You know, usually for a young girl, you give her a doll. She'll take the doll and she'll, she'll pretend it's a baby and take care of it. Where you, you give, a, give my son a doll, he's going to smash it into the, into the wall. God made husbands stronger so that he can guide and protect and honor her. <laughs> There's another example. One time I was at the gym and I saw this boyfriend-girlfriend couple working out together at the gym. And what that meant was is that, you know, the boyfriend gets up there, he does his bench presses, and then he's like, okay, okay, sweetheart, your turn. And she gets up there and she does her bench presses with the same weight. And I'm thinking, this, something's not right here. You need a new workout partner, buddy. You're, you're, you're either too weak or she's too strong. One or the other. And uh, go ahead and, and go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8, I'm going to read for you Exodus chapter 21. This is not the most popular verse here, but the Bible says it. Exodus, you're training to 1 Samuel chapter 8. I'm going to read for you Exodus chapter 21, verse 7. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. This is a horrible thought, of course, the idea of selling your, your child into slavery or to be a maidservant. But the Bible is saying that if you did do that, which maybe, yeah, God forbid, we'd ever be in a financial situation where you'd even think about selling a, a child. But if that did happen, the Bible is saying here in Exodus is that she shall not go out as the men servants do. So even if you did sell your daughter, which you know, would be ridiculous in our eyes, even if you did sell your daughter, the Bible is clarifying that, hey, she's going to go be a cook or a baker or you know, a housekeeper or something else. She's not going to go in the field like, like the other men are. There's a difference there. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, uh, verse 11 I want to give you some context here. It's, it's basically that the people of Israel are asking Samuel to ask the Lord for a king. And Samuel, of course, doesn't like the idea of this. He's kind of hurt by it. Uh, the Lord doesn't like this either. He's saying, don't worry, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me, the Lord. So 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 11, and he said, this is Samuel. He's going to try to talk him out of it. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands, and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear the ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war, and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. And so I'm bringing this up as another example to show that even in this situation where a king is pulling men and women into the draft, you know, they're, they're drafting these women, men and women, to work for the king, even the king is going to give them different jobs. He's going to give them a different set of standards, a different expectation there. So <clears throat> go to Deuteronomy chapter 20, if you, if you will. Point number three is that men should be courageous and women not so much. And this kind of goes together. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 8, we see uh, Moses giving some rules uh, for basically who should be in the military and who should not be in the military. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 5, I'll go ahead and start reading. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house, and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. What man is he that hath planted a vineyard, and hath not eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife, and hath not taken her? Let him go and return to his house lest he die in the battle, and another man take her. And the officer shall speak further unto the people, and, s and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted, 
Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren faint, brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. So here's the picture. The picture is, is that these, they've got all these men lined up for battle, right? And looking at the men, it's kind of like that old schoolyard pick when you're going to play dodgeball. I played a lot of dodgeball. The schoolyard pick, you say, well, I want you on my team, and I want you on my team. They're lining up the men, and they're saying, hey, who here planted a vineyard and hasn't dedicated it? You know, if, you, if that's you, raise your hand, and then you're going to leave the battle. Why would they do this? Because they're thinking that this person's going to hold his sword back from blood. If he's thinking, man, just, just don't die. Just don't die. Got to eat my vineyard. I, you know, I don't want to die without eating my vineyard yet. He's going to hold his sword back and, and could basically discourage other people from fighting, which is more of a liability than to just go in there full force. The same goes with a man who has, has married a wife or he's, he's pledged to marry a wife and he hasn't taken her yet. He hasn't married yet. He's thinking, man, I just don't want to die in this battle because if I die, I'm not going to get a chance to get married. I've worked so hard to get married. I really want to get married. Don't die. He's going to pull his sword back from blood. And what the Bible is saying here, what they would do, it's really wise, actually. They'd say, hey, if you have these good, legitimate reasons to not be in the battle right now, just go ahead and just skip the battle. Don't even go. And one of those reasons is being fearful and faint-hearted. If somebody's just there, I'm a man of science. <laughs> if somebody's just there, you know, too weak to fight, he's going to freak everybody else out. And the whole, they're going to kill everybody. It's better that just a few weaklings leave and let the men fight. Now, this is something that, you know, you could say would be the same for, for the church or for the ministry. If you're not ready, you know, to count the cost of going into the ministry, if you think you're going to just come up here and, you know, say some jokes or whatever and basically you call it a day without actually doing the fight and the sacrifice, losing your job two or three times. The pastor out in, um, in, in Georgia, lost his, he's lost like five jobs just from preaching his church, you know, they find his church, his sermons, and he loses his job. When you're still commanded to feed your family, you know, you still have to grow your church and do all this stuff. So what I'm saying here is that, you know, if you were to join the ministry and, you know, want to just pull your sword back from blood and not kick people out of the church for fornication or for church discipline, then basically you're going to do more damage in your weakness and being faint-hearted and fearful than it it'd be better for you just to leave the ministry and let someone else take your job. And so fear is contagious, and men should be courageous. And that's kind of like a rhyme. Second Samuel chapter 10, uh, this is a, a, a story of Joab. He's being surrounded on both sides. He tells his brother, be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people, and for the cities of our God, and the Lord will do which that seemeth him good. What we see here is that men need to be of good courage. What does that mean to be of good courage? It means you're equally afraid, but you're choosing to do it anyway. It's a scary thing, jumping off a cliff, you know, a cliff jumping, but you're going to go anyway. You know, maybe it's public speaking. Well, it's a little scary to be public speaking, but you're going to go do it anyway. It's basically having the courage to go do the thing that you're, you would have been scared of anyway. Men should be courageous, and men need to play the men for our people. It basically means the buck stops with me. The buck stops here. If, you know, for me personally, a big moment of building my courage was when I was killing those scorpions. If you remember, one of the first sermons I preached here was the scorpion sermon. You know, I spent a, probably a whole year or so killing scorpions every night before going to bed. And what that means is that having that black light and that hockey stick and you're looking for them. You know, meanwhile, you know, my wife's sleeping with the, with the baby at that time and you know, you, God forbid if the baby were to get stung by the scorpion. I'm, I'm not going to re-preach that whole sermon. But the point is, is that there's that certain line in the sand when you say, listen, I don't care what time it is. It's 2 a.m. We got a scorpion problem, and I'm going to go squash those buggers and go, you know, kill them all. And that's basically the attitude of having courage and being a man. You have to go do, deal with the problem. Just get it done. Do it. And so, you know, this is replicated in the New Testament. I'll, I'll just read this for you for sake of time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. This is a commandment, a New Testament commandment, to quit you like men. What does that mean, quit you like men? Paul is basically referencing the Philistines of all people. The Philistines were in this battle with Israel. Israel was being bad at that time, and God was not going to bless them whatsoever. This is with, uh, uh, just before, uh, um, this was with Eli. And they brought the Ark of the, of the Covenant in, and, and the Philistines thought, you know, surely we're going to die because they're bringing their gods with them, the Ark of the Covenant. 
And, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, God had this reputation for, you know, f destroying Egypt and parting the Red Sea and doing all these mighty things. And so the Philistines, basically, you know, the, our spiritual enemies said, quit you like men. And they fought extra hard and they won that battle. And so Paul is quoting the Philistines, basically the enemy of David and all those people, which simply because you can still learn a good lesson from them, quit you like men, be a man. So how does uh, someone build courage? You know, basically I've, I've done a, a short list here. Uh, jumping off a diving board for a young boy is usually a, a pretty scary thing. The first time jumping off, build some courage. You know, you can build that first, jump off the first stair at, the, at, at home, second stair, third stair, go a little bit higher each time, build the courage. Uh, you know, <laughs> talking to girls for teenagers, you know, I mean, it takes that courage. And there's something about... This isn't in my notes, but I think, why is it so scary for a young man to talk to a girl? I don't know why it's so scary. It shouldn't be scary at all. You're just talking to another human being. But there's something about it. I think it's part of the defense mechanism of, of a woman. L listen, ladies, if a guy is too scared to talk to you, he won't even come up to you, that guy is not going to provide for you. He's not going to defend you against someone else. He's not going to say, like, you're my <laughs> wife, you're my girl. I'm going to protect you against someone else. Someone comes to your house and tries to take your, your wife away, you know, over my dead body. If, if, if you're a young man, if you're too scared to talk to a girl, then you're probably not ready to be dating. I mean, you've got to build that courage. And that's why there's that natural fear barrier. Where does it come from? It's silly overall. But I think there's a natural fear, fear barrier there for a reason. You know, are you going to act in sight instead of your fear? Why is it scary? I don't know. But it takes courage. <clears throat> Again, we see the progression here. David, before he killed Goliath, the giant, he killed the bear, he killed the lion, and then he killed Goliath. And we can build courage in our young men, our young boys, the same way. Go do something small first, and then it builds, it progresses. Jacob lifted the rock, the heavy stone, then he wrestled Jesus Christ, then he became a great nation, you know, that even bigger. And David, of course, went on to, you know, rule that nation as well. These are good examples. Uh, <clears throat> here's something interesting. Uh, go ahead and go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm going to read for you Jeremiah chapter 51. The mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight and have remained in their holds. Their might hath failed. They became as women. They have burned her dwelling places. Her bars are broken. What does it mean when mighty men fail to fight? They become as women. Bible saying here there's a different standard. Mighty men have failed to fight, they become as women. There's a note in my Bible, this is basically that saying, you know, you play baseball like a girl. The mighty, I mean, there's nothing wrong with girls playing baseball. They're of course they're going to play it like a girl. They are a girl. That's their expectation. But a man should not play baseball like a girl. A, a man should play baseball like a man. So when it says here, the, the mighty men have forborne to fight, they have remained in their holds. They're too scared. Oh, I'm a man of science. Their might hath failed. They became as women. They're too scared. You know, the, the picture is, you know, the knees shaking together. Ah! If you don't want that to happen, you want to be courageous. Okay, <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. I will therefore that younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. W what does this mean here? I got a little bit ahead of myself in my notes here, but basically what I wanted to say, if I could go back a second, is that women should not be in the military. And this is something that we see today where women are in the military quite a bit. Women should not be in the military. Women's place is not in the military. Now, I could also argue that, you know, you should not be in, um, in the United States, you know, Babylon's military. But in general, women don't have any place being on the battlefield. They're supposed to be protected, not out there battling. And this is something that our world is getting really confused about because even Governor Doug Ducey, our, our Arizona governor, he recently was speaking to, at a funeral, for a fallen female Marine. Now, I could only shake my head at this because what in the world, you know, is a, is a woman being a Marine for? And she goes out in the field and she gets killed, you know, and we're supposed to be shocked by this or to mourn this. I mean, it, I don't understand it. Why would you do that? Women's place is not in the military. She's not, women's place is not to be a Marine on the front line battlefield. A woman's place is in the home. 
especially a Christian woman's place. And so that's what we see right here in, in 1 Timothy. I will therefore that younger marry, women marry, bear children, guide the house, and give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside under Satan. That means if you disagree with this verse and you, th you think, well, women should be in the military if they want to, <laughs> you're basically turning aside after Satan. And here's what's really, really interesting. It's so freaky in a, in a way. But, you know, at this church, we love the King James Bible. It's the word perfect, word of God. It's preserved. You can tr bet your life on it. King James. I'm proud to have it. But what's so interesting is, you know, the false modern Bible versions, the ESV, the NIV, the HIV, the, the, all these other false modern ones, they're all corrupt. They're all missing verses. They're, they're worthless. Burn them on the grill. I mean, I burned mine on the barbecue grill. But they all still have this verse. 1 Timothy, I will therefore that younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. The NIV says the same thing, folks. It says the same thing. That means that if you're watching YouTube and there's some woman on YouTube giving some sermonette, some sermon with millions of people, you can comment, hey, your trash NIV Bible says that you shouldn't be doing this. This is not Christianity. Go home. Bear children. Guide your house. What are you doing on stage? You could argue, you know, that it's okay if they're teaching only to women, but there's, when there's 5,000 people there, there's also men there too. <laughs> so, you know, and there's, uh, I forget that lady, um, What's the name of that, that really ugly lady who looks like the Joker? What's her? J Joyce Myers. Yeah, her husband, I guess, sits in the front row. You know, I, I'm sure he sits like, like this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's not good. And so I'm running out of time, but my, my fourth point is this. Hollywood movies would have you believe that deep inside every woman is a crime-fighting superhero ninja. This is a, a, obviously a ridiculous point, but my point here is that is if you were to go to the latest blockbuster, you know, action thriller movies, I'm thinking, you know, when I was a kid, it was like Spider-Man, you know, like the first one before the eighth or tenth of them. Spider-Man, Batman, all these other ones. Now it's like Wonder Woman. It's, isn't there like a Batman, a Catwoman yeah. movie? I don't, you know, I, I mean, most of us don't know this, but somebody told me, I think it was Pastor Anderson who said that, that like, I don't know, 60% of the action movies for children now have a lead female role. And I, I saw this clip, uh, this trailer, where there's some new movie coming out. Maybe it already did come out. But basically, this woman is, is in the military. She's like a high-ranking military official. And she's got all her men like, you know, yes, ma'am. And she's like, you, you know, jerk, what's wrong with you? And she's like slapping these men around and doing all this stuff and like, you know, then her superpowers kick in and she's grabbing the men by the throat and throwing them through the room and all this stuff. I even know a coworker who went and left my, my company to go work as a field agent for the FBI. And she wanted to go and take her gun and bust down the doors and, you know, where did, I mean, she was very young at the time. I mean, she was 19 years old. But the point is, where do women get this idea? Why do women suddenly want to become, you know, police men <laughs> or, or, or crime fighters or superheroes or vigilantes. I mean, where does this idea come from? It's coming from the movies, from, the, from Hollywood movies, from the TV shows. And let me just put this to rest right now. Go ahead. I don't know where I had you turn last, but go ahead and, and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I'm just going to show you that women are not, should not be expected to be crime fighter, you know, vigilante types, you know, fighting crime at night, raising kids in the daytime. It's just not... It's not what we see here in the Bible. <clears throat> First Samuel chapter 30, I want to set the context here because I, I think this is really important. The context here is that S David and his, and his men, he's, David's not the king of Israel just yet, Saul's still the king. David and his men were just about to go fight with the Philistines against Israel. And the Philistines said, no, it's by the heads of our men that you know, David's going to be reunited with Saul. And he said, we don't want these guys to fight. And they said, okay, whatever, and, and they went home. And I think that was part of God, because I don't, I don't think God wanted that deception in, in, involved there. Anyway, while they're leaving the battle, you know, this is the battle that Saul dies at. They're leaving the battle. Turns out they go back to their camp, and all their women, their wives, and their, their sons and daughters are all taken captive. Let's go ahead and start right here. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. 
And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Am 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 Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire. Now remember, Ziglag is, is like the town where they lived. And had taken the women captives, that therein they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that, and all that were with them lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahoniam, and the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because of the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abathar, the priest, Amalek's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at, at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered them, uh, No, don't worry about it, because all the women are superheroes. They're going to save themselves. They're going to rescue themselves. <laughs> Obviously, that's not what it says. Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. Without fail, recover all. And so, let's stop there. But what I want to show you here is that it's a real simple picture. David and his mighty men are over here. The women, the children, all the vulnerable, vulnerable people are staying by the stuff over here. David's over here. The women get taken captive. Why didn't they just fight themselves? You know, David's wife, Abigail, she pulls out the sword. You know, she's doing her thing, Lord of the Rings, you know, stabbing the guy. Why doesn't she do that? Well, maybe because that's impossible. It's not going to happen. You know, why doesn't God just, you know, empower them? Like, well, don't worry, David, I'm going to give all the wives supernatural strength and they're going to you know, throw the men around like an action movie would have you believe could be done. It's not going to happen, folks. You know, if you're a woman here, don't join the FBI wanting to be a field agent. And if you remember, we had that, that, that female police officer who basically tackled another woman in our church. Why did she tackle the woman? There's other men there. She could have tackled somebody bigger. But that female police officer knew that tackling that older woman was really all she could tackle all she could do. Do so you remember the Chandler Soul Winning Marathon, that, that, uh, the police one? And so if women are such mighty warriors, then why did they get taken captive at all? I, and I've, I'm not trying to be down on women. I'm just trying to set the reality, set the, you know, calling a spade a spade. You shouldn't expect your daughter to be some crime-fighting superhero. Why didn't David's wives rescue themselves? Why, did God why didn't God supernaturally strengthen the women and break out of captivity on their own? You know, that'd be a great movie that Hollywood would do. Women, you know, and, and women who work out too much, I'm, I'm talking about the people who actually are bodybuilding type women. You can see them on YouTube if you want to be disgusted. But they have a hard time having children. They can't do it. I mean, th their, their body fat ratio, their hormones get messed up. It's not God's plan. If you were to go become a triathlon runner, you know, certain chemical processes in your body is going to turn off. And you're not going to be able to conceive. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to you know, go back and eat that high-fat diet and kind of recoup those hormones. And you know, this is just something that, that the world today would try to have you believe that everybody you know, can do this. Everybody, everybody should do it. So I'm basically out of time. I want to end. I want to close with this. Let me jump ahead a little bit. I was going to preach you know, men should be rugged and, and sleep outside, or at least they could if they had to, sleep in their car. Uh, let me, let me, sometimes you have to. <laughs> yeah, amen, I, I see that hand. <laughs> Let's, let me end with this. Go ahead and go to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. <clears throat> the book of Nehemiah is a really interesting book because, because of where it is in time. You know, in the very beginning, we have Adam and Eve. That's the very beginning. There's, you know, before that is only God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The very beginning is Adam and Eve, but then, you know, who knows how long, Pastor Anderson would probably know, it, it's, it's roughly, you know, at least a thousand years before we see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and, and the law is given. And that's what we see, the law is given. And I've read you a lot of verses from the Old Testament, from Exodus, from Leviticus, from Deuteronomy, we've read a lot of those. 
But now we're going to take a look at Nehemiah because to put things in perspective, here's what's happened. And you'd have to read the Bible to know this, but you, I'm sure most of you know King David you know, had peace on every side. He was a man of war. He had peace all around. And he gave the kingdom, he died, he gave the kingdom to Solomon, his son. Solomon built the temple. It's a big, long chapter where he dedicates the temple. He's on his, on his knees praying to God, dedicating it. Hands in the air. Solomon builds the temple, and that takes a long time. It took a lot of resources, a lot of people, a lot of man hours. And, of course, men built the temple. And that's another great point. Men did that work. So men built the temple, but what we see here is that over time, if you're reading your Bible cover to cover, you're going to see that the temple is eventually in need of drastic repair. So think about your own house. You have your house. There's certain things that need to be fixed on the house. It's kind of like a constant problem. You've got to always fix things. Maybe it's the wallpaper, the shingles, the, the gutters. There's always something to be repaired. The roof, for example. Well, there's two times throughout history where the temple of God is in need of drastic repair. So you have the temple. The temple is built. It's doing great. Nobody is repairing it because it doesn't need repair. Then it needs massive repair. They fix the temple. Then it's doing great. It's doing well. And then they need massive repair again. Well, then that temple is then destroyed. The children of Israel are taken into captivity. I'm talking about Judah, of course, because Israel is already gone. The northern tribes, the ten tribes are wiped out by Assyria. We have Judah and Benjamin. They're brought into, into Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, Babylon. That's where we have Daniel. Daniel's there for 70 years. And then we have the book of Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah, where they're coming out of captivity. So this is a long time period, and I'm not using time, uh, the numbers. I'm just telling you that this is the temple basically three times, you know, once built and then twice restored and then built again. And what I'm about to show you is that you could argue, well, times have changed. You know, men, you know, women can work on the temple now. Women can do that. And no, they, times don't change. God's word is still relevant today as it was then. Let's look at this. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 18. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 18. Sorry, verse 14. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. So who's doing the fighting? They're fighting for your sons, your wives and your daughters uh, and your brethren. So these are men fighting. Verse 15. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that, w that it was known unto us, and God hath brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one to his work, his. And it came to pass that from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them both held the spear and the shield and the bows and the harbogens, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. And they which builded on, on the wall, and they that bare burdens, and those that laid it, every one with his, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. Here's the key: for the builders, for the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so builded. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. So, we just read a long passage there. The question is, where were the women? Well, obviously the women aren't building. The women aren't holding the swords. The women aren't holding the shovels, the hammers. They're not building. The women aren't even holding the trumpet for the alarm. Now, what I'm trying to, to paint a picture of here is that in this time of history, the people are very few. Only a few, a remnant, made it out of captivity. And you could argue, if this was 2020, they'd say, well, guys, you know, we're really struggling here. We don't have a lot of people. We need more hands. And we need the, our country needs the women to work. And what you could say is, well, let's go ahead and put the kids in daycare, or don't care. Let's put them in daycare. And, you know, you wives, we want you to hold the trumpet. And you wives, you women, we want you to just stand here with this bow and arrow. And you just wait on patrol. Meanwhile, the men, you know, work with their hammers. Or maybe it's vice versa. The men will hold the swords waiting on patrol. And you women, get down there and break your backs and build this wall. We don't see that at all. I mean, in theory, you could argue, some politician would say, well... You know, if we add the women to the workplace, we could, in theory, double our efforts. And we could have twice as many people. Wow, look at that. Twice as many people, twice as many hands, eyes watching. No. The men, even in this time, they said, hey, our women are going to take care of our children in the home. We want to eat dinner tonight. I would rather, I'm going to hold the sword in one hand. I'm going to hold the hammer in the other hand. And we're going to build this thing and fight at the same time. 
And this is a big truth today because what we see is that, you know, politicians, they'd say, well, you know, guys, we can't win this election unless we get the women to vote. And even you'll hear them say, like, well, guys, you know, our political party can't win this election unless we get illegal immigrants to vote. I heard, you know, and what do they have to do with America? I mean, they're not here. You could say, I heard, uh, you know, Europe, most of Europe has voted for Biden. I'm thinking, well, they're not even Americans. What do they have to do with anything? You know, keep them out of our country, Europe. We don't care about your vote. What I'm trying to say here is that you could see how some sort of wicked politician would say, wow, if we add this workforce into the, into the workforce, the women into the workforce, we can suddenly double our numbers. Wow, what a quick, easy solution. Vote for me. No. Even the men of old time, even the men, this is thousands of years later, after these commandments, they could say, that Bible's too old. God's commandment's too old. It's actually a miracle that they had the word of God. They had it then. And they find it, and they read it, and they're crying and weeping. It's raining. That's the, that's the scene here. But what you see is that the men of the time still said, no, I would rather fight and build. I'll do two jobs. You give me two hats. I'll work double time, keep my wife at home. And that's the exact attitude of what we need to teach our young men to rise up and do, to be that strong leader. And we need to teach our women to say, yes, you need to stay at home and take care of the children. That's where you're best suited. That's where you're best placed. And if anybody thinks I'm being too hard on women, you know, read Proverbs chapter 31. There's a tendency here, I think, if you're hearing this for the first time, you could think, you know, well, you just hate women. That's not true at all. The Bible talks a lot about women. Women are great. And if you read Proverbs chapter 31, I'm not going to read it to you here. It's in my notes, of course, but I'm not going to read it to you. If you read Proverbs chapter 31, you'll see that this woman is strong. She girds her arms with, with strength. She girds her loins with strength. She's working long hours taking care of her house and her children. It's a tough job. And anybody, you know, who has... A, a, a wife with a, a baby, you know that the wife's supposed to be on bed rest. And my wife just recently was on bed rest, you know, a, a, a while ago. And what that meant was that I took a, a month off from work, and my job was to do her job. And it's tough work, <laughs> cooking and cleaning, and we do cloth diapers, so you're spraying all these diapers. I mean, it's tough work being a woman. And the point here is that God has given us our work. Praise God. Men have men, men's work. Women have women's work different roles. Our children should be different. And it's just, it's, it's how God designed it. Let's pray.